Holiday horror films are a tale as old as time. Silent Night, Deadly Night, and Black Christmas for December festivities. Leprechaun for St. Patty's Day. Halloween for, well, Halloween. One of the most perplexing notes on this is that Valentine's Day, one of the days we had our most vulnerable as human beings, We're gonna go now, okay. hasn't really received uh, the number of entries it deserves. Now sure, we have the Canadian tax shelter funded wonder my Bloody Valentine from 81, which deserves the praise it gets. And it's inevitable remake in 09, which I unapologetically love, by the way. I mean, we get the class act, Tom Atkins taking a pickaxe to the face in 3D. But the only other film that really centers around the February holiday is today's black sheep subject, 2001's Valentine. The year 01 was a bit of a black sheep for the genre, as it was full of underwhelming sequels, like directed video offerings Wishmaster 3, The Mangler 2, and Children of the Corn Revelation. Jeepers Creepers, a film that is the ultimate can you separate the art from the artist, along with John Carpenter's most misguided entry. <laughs> That's beautiful. Now, the undisputed best of the year may just be the fantastic ghost story with a twist, Nicole Kidman's The Others. And one of the only other original and non-straight-to-video releases that year was Valentine. Based on a book, though very loosely if you look at the plots of both side by side, Valentine is a throwback to the slashes of old. And this may have been its biggest grievance against it, as it was made in the post-Scream world. A world where your slasher movie needed to be smarter and self-aware. Or complete parodies like the Scary Movie franchise. Sitting today with an extremely low 17% on Rotten Tomatoes, the film did not fare any better critically at the time of its release. Now, even though it made back its $30 million on uh, an economical $10 million budget, critics ripped it apart for being bland and generic, something Scream just wouldn't allow anymore. The film begins at a junior high school Valentine's Day dance, as we follow a stereotypical nerdy student named Jeremy continue to get shot down when he asks out girls if they'd like to dance. Eventually, and somewhat reluctantly, later begins a hookup with the boy. When they are discovered, the girl lies and says that Jeremy assaulted her, which leads to Jeremy being publicly stripped and beaten in front of the dance. The last scene of the prologue is of Jeremy's nose bleeding as the screen fades to black. Now this is a hallmark of slasher royalty, with it setting up a believable and tragic backstory in the same way that The Burning or Halloween does. In classic style, the film then jumps ahead where instead of following up their victim, we are checking in on the lives of the group of girls that sent him on the path of retribution and insanity. We first see our killer go after Katherine Heigl's character after she gets back to work from a terrible date with a terrible guy, which sets up the rest of our group, who are mostly unlikable, and introduces our bumbling cop character, <laughs> who is also unlikable, we then get set piece after set piece, the group of friends getting picked off along the way, while also meeting an unlikable artist, an unlikable boyfriend, an unlikable girlfriend, and a creepy, unlikable next door neighbor. I'm telling you, they want you to hate these characters. All culminating at a Valentine's party, where the movie ends with a twist that isn't uh, a twist at all. One of the main male characters in the movie has been Jeremy the entire time. Oh shit. At least they had the guts to not have a happy ending. A common complaint, and one that I would say works in the film's favor, is that most of the characters are incredibly unlikable. This is normally a detriment in a film where you're forced to root for characters you don't like. But here, it's almost satisfying when the friends are picked off one by one. The only downside to this is that there is not much of an emotional impact when one of the character dies. But you know, at this point it's like, huh, fuck them. Let's talk about what else this film does right. The Masked Silent Killer. A cool concept for a big bad and uh, under different circumstances, I can see running it out in a few sequels. The killer also tells the girls he's coming for them with insanely detailed and elaborate horrifying Valentine's Day cards that really push what a cool production designer can come up with in a horror film. While the studio didn't release the film on Valentine's Day weekend, they still had the balls to give it a February release. 
a place that uh, horror films usually go to die. But the studio set up a digital e Valentine's Day card that people could freely send to each other. This is no Blair Witch fake website uh, documentary combo, but it still shows initiative and effort, especially with anything to do with the internet in 2001. I mean, what are you gonna do? Fucking threaten people on AOL and some Messenger? Check that shit out, man, the internet. Let's see if those fucks wrote something new about us or that stupid ass flick. The film's casting is also a strength. Capitalizing on David Boreanaz's huge TV popularity on both Buffy and its spin-off Angel, as well as Katherine Heigl in the middle of her run on Roswell, while filling in the rest of the cast, not with superstars, but reliable talent, like Marley Shelton and Denise Richards. Marley Shelton shines in her only opportunity to be a final girl, and Denise Richards perfects the bitchy hot friend part, while still riding high from her role as a nuclear physicist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. Dr. Christmas Jones in the third Brosnan Bond outing, The World Is Not Enough. And, well, all of these actors give the film more of an everyman aesthetic, rather than uh, that Hollywood gloss which actually helps the story. One of the places where the film lets us down, though, is in its execution. No, literally the executions. A slasher movie lives and dies by its kills, pun intended. And Valentine was tame, tame, given its R rating. From the first kill of a young Katherine Heigl, all the way to the final house party, the setup for the kills always seems to deliver more than the final release. There could have been so much more in a morgue, or with a bow and arrow than just uh, abruptly stops. The other thing is the utter lack of skin. Now, that's fine if a horror movie wants to class things up a bit. Yeah, sure. But when you're trying to harken back to the slashers of old, a nod to the great 80s, you might want to actually follow the important beats they lay down. It's difficult to believe that an old school slasher will be centered around people finding love and, you know, hookups. Around Valentine's Day can actually lack on the hookups and the slashing. Now, is Valentine a horror classic? Well, no. But it isn't a bad one either. If you're looking for something to break up the tradition of watching My Bloody Valentine, or its remake, then this is a pretty good option that has a bit more going for it than we all remember. It may not be a classic, but a Scream Factory, a company dedicated to preserving the wonderful art of horror and their many cult favorites. If they decided this movie deserved a special edition Blu-ray in 2019, well then damn it, pop this bad boy on and give it a watch. It's good enough for me. Hey, thanks for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Below Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends to like this sort of content. And turn on the bell, you know the one, to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. You know, we're an independent company, and we appreciate all of your support.